the coming of Christ, the birth of the Son of God. Uh, we tend to look back on this story as a story oftentimes uh, with tons of certainty that things happened exactly like they should have and were supposed to. And I think that's true, but it's good to be reminded that in the middle of God working mightily, particularly in this way, nothing seemed certain. It was completely disruptive and disrupting. I want to talk about that a little bit here in our time this morning as we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent, that it's disrupting that when God moves, when his love shows up in our lives, it's not always warm and fuzzy. In fact, bigger things happen than we expect. And that's a beautiful and a wonderful thing. I love, I love the term that Jason used earlier. This, it's this beautiful collision. And I think that's, we need to be reminded of that for Christmas. It's this beautiful collision of, um, of, of joy and fear, of hope and, and uncertainty, of doubt and faith and all these things that are just part of our human existence. It's so beautiful that we celebrate that God meets us there. And so we have this collision at Christmas of, of a holy God putting on flesh, which is just amazing. We can't wrap our minds around that. Let's, let's not get used to that concept and put it on some theological shelf. That God became flesh, a human, has huge implications for us. And it is, and it should be, just as disrupting today as it was some 2,000 years ago. It's amazing. Let's pray. Let's open up the word of God together. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1. But let me pray for us. Father God, what a wonderful thing it is to gather together as a church family and friends to celebrate Christmas. It's in less than a week, Lord, and that's, that's shocking. Um. But it also, Lord, I'm, I'm comforted by the reality that there, there, are, there are certainties in this life that, that, are, that are rooted and grounded in you, Lord. And we just together, once again, are reminded of the reality and the truth that you have come, that that's not just a story that we tell this time of year, but it's a historical event that we celebrate that changes us here and now. So Lord, would you, in the power of your spirit, would you form us and change us here today as we also look ahead to your second coming, as we look, Lord, to uh, the, the certainty and the promise of your return. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning to those of you who are online. Uh, it's so good, so good to be here with you all. Last week, I was up at Desert Springs Bible Church uh, preaching up there, and Blake was here, um, but I did miss you all. It's really great to be back here with you all. Um, today, uh, like I said, we're in Luke 1. We're actually going to be looking at the text that uh, the Pfeiffers read up here for us during this candle reading and uh, the candle lighting. They weren't reading a candle. They were lighting a candle. Um, I want to talk today about the love of God and how it's demonstrated in God becoming flesh. We call this the incarnation. In John 3.16, Jesus is talking to a Pharisee, a, a religious leader named Nicodemus, and he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Real, real short Christmas sermon right there. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that God demonstrates in lo his love for us, the Bible says, while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. Now, love, of course, is not the only attribute of God. The Bible talks about all sorts of, sorts of attributes, and we can't even fully wrap our mind around these concepts because God is an infinite God, and so uh, we try to put it in human terms, and we talk about things like the wrath of God and the justice of God and the holiness of God and the, the knowledge of God and the wisdom and all of these things, and, and they're all related. So to even try to parse them out and go, well, let's just talk about this one aspect of God is already doing the character and the person of God an injustice. And yet God is gracious to us as we try to wrap our minds around and relate to an infinite God creator who is Lord of all things. But today, 
I want to talk about the love of God. All of these things, his attributes, can be seen in the Christmas story. Even here in this text that we're going to be looking at uh, together today, Jesus is Savior, but he's also Lord. Jesus is rescuer, but he's also judge. And yet the way in which God comes into this world, the way in which he came into this world, humbly, as a baby, as a human being, is certainly a demonstration of his love. We can't ignore it. And so I want to talk about the love of God. The story begins in Luke chapter uh, 1 here, the story that we're going to be looking at in verse 26. It begins with uh, God sending the angel Gabriel. Uh, Again, we, we see here that God is initiating, he's sending, he's coming to this world. And so he sends the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel is a messenger. And so the angel Gabriel shows up, um, was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So there's lots packed in here. We have this kind of this, what we would call a supernatural event, an angel showing up in the most unlikely of places in Nazareth in Galilee. And the thing that I want to start out with here is, is really the most obvious thing with respect to the love of God that we celebrate at Christmas, is that it's comforting. The love of God is, is very comforting to us. Uh, in fact, at Christmas time, we, we like the coziness, we like the candles, uh, we, like, we like that feeling, I do anyway, I like that feeling of just being reminded of the comfort that I have in the love of God, and that's a good thing. God's love is comforting because he pursues us, even to the most humble, the most obscure places of our life. We see this here. There's so much packed into these couple of verses here in Luke. That Joseph is from the house of David, so there's this royal lineage that, that he comes from. This is really important as it relates to Old Testament prophecy that Jesus would be of the house of David. But he goes to Nazareth. In Galilee, Nazareth was a nowhere town. Nazareth was, was literally pretty much not on the map in those days. In fact, people who knew of Nazareth would say things like, does anything good come out of Nazareth? It was a border town in kind of the hillbilly section of Galilee. It would be like Ajo, Arizona or something like that. And that's where God sends his messenger, Gabriel essentially to uh, a a peasant household, to a peasant woman that he's going to use mightily. God's love pursues, it initiates, and God's love hands out favor and grace. Gabriel greets Mary. I mean, just just imagine that for a moment, what what that must have been like for Mary to suddenly see this this angel. We don't know what she was doing. Maybe like in the video depicted, maybe she was resting or sleeping. Maybe she was doing other things. Who We don't know entirely. And yet this angel shows up and says, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Out of his mouth, we see that this, this pursuing love of God bestows favor and grace upon Mary. Favor means to be acceptable. And I'm sure that that Mary was a devout person. I have no doubt of that. But I also don't believe she was sinless. Because the Bible is clear in that, that only Christ was without sin. And yet the angel Gabriel calls her, oh, favored one. God's love bestows favor, even when we aren't looking for it. And God's love wants to dwell with his people. That's the whole point of coming in, in the form of Christ, to dwell, to make his dwelling place here. John points that out in John chapter 1. For the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the angel Gabriel confirms that, saying, the Lord is with you. And there's this common message that we hear in this as Mary responds out of fear. There's a common message of love in Scripture, and it is this, don't be afraid. The good news of Christmas 
is that God has not left this world to languish in sin and rebellion and the destruction that that sin and rebellion has brought upon existence, on our lives, on relationships, on creation, but he has come to repair, to redeem, to fix what was broken because God loves us, because God loves us. And maybe for some of you that's hard to believe. Maybe if the angel Gabriel were to show up to you and say, greetings, O favored one, you would go, what are you talking about? Do you know what I've done? Do you know what I've thought? He does. And yet his grace pursues us. His love extends to us and calls us into communion with him. So God's love is comforting, but it's also confusing. I think Mary was deeply perceptive. I think she was very intelligent, very thoughtful. We see this in a couple of places. She, she breaks out into this song or this poem when she's hanging out with her relative Elizabeth, and it's, it's beautiful. Look it up in, in, Luke, um, in Luke here in chapter 2, or chapter 1 still. Later on in Luke chapter 2, when, they, when the shepherds appear, and you got to wonder, I was thinking about this the, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. The shepherds, the, the angels appear to the shepherds. It's an amazing moment, right? And then they go and they run and they find Jesus and Mary and Joseph, and Jesus is in the manger, and it's all just kind of schmoopy and quaint and stuff like that. But it must have been so disrupting. It must have been so just confusing. So these shepherds show up and go, hey, you... Uh, you know, they introduce themselves, and there's Mary and Joseph. We just saw these angels, and this is what they said. And it says that Mary treasured these things up in her heart. You got to wonder what she had been thinking for the last nine months. You, you even wonder maybe, like, why didn't the angels show up to us? You got to wonder if, as, as, as Jesus was being born, she didn't know what to expect. The Son of God, she's giving birth to the Son of God, and yet here he is, and he looks like every other baby. What sort of things must have been running through her mind? How confusing would that have been? And yet Mary is really, really thoughtful, and she treasures these things in her heart, and she contemplates these things. And her her response to Gabriel, right, this angel shows up and says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, there's some of us in, in, uh, in the room, if you're, or if you're watching online, if, you, if the angel Gabriel showed up to you like that, you'd be like, Thanks. How'd you know? (laughs) Mary doesn't, though. Mary's confused. In fact, it says she's troubled. This is is troubling. And some of you in the room, you're like, no, I get that. And an angel of the Lord shows up and goes, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. You'd be like, what does he want from me? I don't know if that's what Mary was thinking, but it says that she's troubled. Maybe she didn't think that she was anyone special. Just some girl in Nazareth, meant to just live out her life in obscurity, to live, to maybe perhaps get, to get married to Joseph, maybe have some kids, and then pass away at the end of her life. This is troubling. When God shows up, even when it's full of love and grace, it's troubling. It's confusing. If it's not confusing, if this, if the love of God is not ever confusing to you, then you might be overestimating your loveliness. You see, God pursues us and initiates his love with us, not because we are lovely. Certainly, the Bible says that we are made in the image of God, and we are made to receive his love. And so there there is this. There is this desire that God has for us, for us to know him and to be in relationship with us. So we can't discount that, that image of God. And yet the Bible also says that in our sin that's in us that, have, that has rejected God and walked away from him, anybody in their right mind would, would, would leave the relationship based on, I mean, every one of us, is to use a common term right now, is toxic. In our sin and in our rebellion, 
The fact that God continues to pursue humankind, the fact that he would come as a human being to condescend so much as to become among the created is confounding and it is confusing. It's it's confusing because he doesn't give up. It's confusing because it's not earned. We live in this system of give and take, of of, of earning, where if I could just be good enough, then I would be called, oh, favored one with God. That's not how it works. Mary is called, oh, favored one, because God chose to favor her. And again, not to take anything away from Mary, certainly Elizabeth calls her blessed among women, but God bestows his favor, and that's confusing because we live in this system of earning, of of good and bad, and if I can just do enough to earn God's favor, then I'll be okay. That's not the gospel. There's no good news in that. Hey, good news, you gotta work hard. You gotta earn God's favor on your own. That's not good news, that's not the gospel. The good news, the gospel, is that God and his love has initiated this with us by coming in human form, by being born as Jesus. The Bible is full of people. We see this all throughout Scripture, this this unending love of God. In fact, the Bible is full of people who fight against God, who doubt him, who reject him, and yet it's also these people who proclaim the love of God endures forever. It's a common chorus that we hear throughout the Old Testament. The love of God endures forever, and that is true today. That whatever cycle we're caught in right now, whatever, whatever has been disrupting you, whatever secret sin you can't get out of, whatever doubts you have, whatever loneliness and weariness and struggles that you are experiencing right now, the endless love of God endures forever, and it continues to pursue us. Now, oftentimes, we can check out. We run to other things to try to cope. And God is so gracious that he he continues to to lovingly and, and often quietly and gently pursue us. And my prayer is that will overtake us because he loves us so much. He constantly pursues the lost, the rebellious, the weak, the cowards. There's actually another time in Scripture in the, in the book of Judges where the angel of the Lord appears to a person and calls them, O oh, favored one. Or it doesn't say, O oh, oh, favored one per se, but it, it, basically, it says... Um, It's to Gideon. And the angel of the Lord shows up to Gideon and says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Do you know where Gideon was when this angel showed up and called him O mighty man of valor? He was hiding in a wine press. And yet, the angel of the Lord speaks this truth over him and pulls him out. And God continues to whisper, his truth over us as his people. You're my child, and I love you. You are favored as he continues to pursue us with his love, wanting to pull us out of the the shackles and the the prison that sin has created created around us. God's love does not see what is. He sees what will be through his power and his purpose. God's love is comprehensive. God has made us to be with him. And ever since the rebellion of Adam and Eve, he has put his plan in motion to restore our relationship to him, to one another, and to creation. We kind of get this history lesson almost, or not even a history lesson, but we get this really, really big scope of things here as the angel Gabriel is talking to Mary. He says, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. 
Notice that the angel Gabriel doesn't say, Mary, Jesus is going to come. He's going to die, die for your sins. And if you just trust in him, that you get to go to heaven one day. That's not wrong. That's true. But that is incomplete. That's part of it. That's a huge part of it, that we are restored personally to God. But what is happening through Christ, what the love of God is doing, is something that's far bigger than just any one of us. He was restoring his kingdom. He's restoring his reign and his rule in the world. That Jesus, this Jesus is going to be called king and will sit on the throne of David, not for a time, forever. Forever. God is restoring all things, and yes, that means that we can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but it doesn't end there. God's restoring all things, our relationship to him, our relationships to one another, our relationship to creation, because a new creation is coming, a restored creation is coming, where we will live with Christ as he rules and reigns in his kingdom. And this is an amazing thing here that the angel Gabriel says. Nothing is impossible with God. The love of God is so permeating, it is so big, it is so everywhere that nothing could be imp is impossible with God. That his love drives him beyond what we think is possible. It spills out into the impossible. It's almost awkward how often the word virgin is used in this text, isn't it? We get it. Mary was a virgin. I really believe it matters that Mary was a virgin. I really, I really believe that the author, Luke, here is, really, is wanting us to, to know this and hear this. And here's, here's why I say that. Luke wraps the story of Jesus' birth and the story of John, the Baptist's birth, together almost as if they're one story. And they really, they really are. Like there's this really unique link between John the Baptist and Jesus. In fact... If you were to go back into the beginning of Luke chapter 1 here, when the angel uh, Gabriel appears to Zechariah, Zechariah is in the temple and he's doing the priestly duties. If you were to put the appearance of the angel and the conversation that the angel has with Zechariah next to the appearance and the conversation that the angel has with Mary, they're almost identical. The dialogue is similar. There's objections that they raise, although Zechariah's is one of, like, prove it, and Mary's like, oh, okay, how? How is this going to happen? But it really, it's fascinating how similar it is. And I think Luke's doing this on purpose. He's saying, hey, these are really linked. This is really important. But there's some really important diversions then that occur. So you have these similarities and you go, oh, okay, the same thing is happening. But then with Mary and the talk of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the way that she is going to become pregnant, you go, nah, this isn't the same. It's different. It matters that she was a virgin. Because where the Holy Spirit was going to come upon John, and he would have a mighty ministry as he heralds in the coming of the Messiah, of Jesus, and his preaching and his baptism, the Holy Spirit doesn't come upon Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the cause for Jesus' conception. That's much, much different. I don't understand it fully, but I think it's super important. Luke puts these together. In, in Luke 1, 23 to 24, um, it says that, and when his time of service has ended, so he's talking about Zechariah, so he'd been serving in the temple. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. So they conceived in the regular way. Another way to, to write this would be Zechariah went home to his wife, yada, 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 she was pregnant. That's not what it says about Jesus. It's much different. Not with Mary. The comparison is meant to show us that there's something utterly different about her baby. He is the son of God conceived by the Holy Spirit. And we hear this again. Well, we, 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 again, I want to just point out 
where he says, nothing will be impossible with God. That's an amazing statement. That's a true statement. That's, that's true on a theological level. That's true like on a real practical level. Maybe that's all you needed to hear today is that you feel like you're stuck in something that just feels impossible. Perhaps it's even the love of God. It's impossible that God would love you and pursue you. And yet we need to hear this, that nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible with God. This is also a shout out back to Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, where there was another couple who was having a hard time having a baby, just like Zechariah and Elizabeth. In fact, their lives are very, very interestingly the same, and I think that's important too, as we understand this, this redemption theology through Israel. Like something's happening here. And uh, the angel says to Abraham and Sarah, nothing will be impossible with God, essentially, as they're promised a baby, Isaac, to be born. And the big Gabriel says his name will be Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, the Son of God and King. This is amazing news. And I'm touched by Mary's response here. She simply says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Right? Mary's thoughtful. She's intuitive. Already her her wheels are cranking and going, okay, I'm going to give birth to the Son of God. What's going to happen to me? I think that's a really, really good question. It means that she's wrestling with this promise. She's wrestling with this good news of a Savior being born. Yeah, but, but in her and through her? This is a really good question that maybe we need to be better at asking. What, is this not, what does this mean for me? Like, what do I get out of this? But this is going to change some things. What's going to happen to me? How, is it, how will this be? She was coming to terms, I think, with an important reality of God's love. And that is that God's love is imposing. It's disrupting. It's not just comforting. It's imposing. (laughs) Is there anything more imposing than a baby? Hey, here's a baby. What? Or how about a spontaneous pregnancy? This is crazy, right? The love of God is pursued, and he's called Mary O' favored one. But it's really, really disrupting and really imposing. Whatever ideas that she may have had about life were quickly being imposed upon. They were out the window. Maybe, maybe she even thought about what her life would be like and dreams and aspirations and things and just rhythms and routines that she had gotten herself into, just like you do. And then something comes along in life and it kind of, it's Im- Im- imposing. I've, I'm embarrassed to admit that as I've gotten older, it's easier and easier to disrupt me. I came home the other day and Shannon had completely rearranged the furniture. <laughs> and outside I'm like, oh, looks nice. And then inside I'm like, do I even live here? And that's a stupid example, but I have to be honest. Like, it's easy for me to get get disrupted. I don't know if you can relate to that or not. You know, like you go, maybe you go to your favorite coffee shop or restaurant or whatever. Like, some of you are going to go to Chick fil A today and it's closed, and you're like, ah, no, and your whole day is ruined. It's so easy for us to get disrupted and Imagine what this must have been like, and yet that's the reality of what it means to come, to come in contact with the love of God. To come in contact with the love of God isn't always fun and, 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 and comfy and cozy and comforting. In fact, the reality is that when an infinite God pursues us with his infinite love, we can't handle it. Like, he's got to really dial it back, and even then... It's entirely disrupting, and it's imposing upon us because, frankly, we are creatures of comfort. There are things that we like about our lives, things that we don't want to change, even even 
in the face of the love of God. At least that's my reality, if I'm being honest. Everything is about to change for Mary. Everything. And not always for the better. The love of God shows up in her life, and it's not going to change things for the better necessarily in the moment. There was, there was most likely scandal surrounding her pregnancy. You can't hide a baby bump in a small town like Nazareth. People were talking. They ended up having to flee and go to Egypt. Can you imagine just like all of a sudden like, hey, we got to go. Flee and go to Egypt. And they come back. And then what kind of things was she having to wrestle through and what kind of conversations were people having with her as her son was out there saying things like, I am the son of God. Doing these miracles. What kind of, how many people were knocking on her door? How confusing must that have been as she and her other kids rallied together to kind of be like, hey, Jesus, like, you, you're, you're kind of making a scene. Let's go. What, what, what would that have been like to watch her son hanging on a cross? Oh, favored one? Really? And yet, we know if we read between the lines that Mary was faithful, that she did seem to see the big picture, that she understood something unique about her son that probably most people did not. He's the Son of God, He is Yahweh saves, He is Jesus. He is Savior and he is King. But I'll bet she didn't see the cross coming. Nobody did. The endless love of God is imposing. It challenges our, our, our sensibilities. And it challenges our lifestyle and our values and our relationships. It's imposing. We need to come to terms with that. And Mary is this model. She gives us this model response to God's imposing love to Gabriel. Gabriel says, hey, all this stuff is going to happen. Oh, you're wondering how it's going to happen? The Spirit of God is going to come upon you and you'll be pregnant. What? And listen to what Mary says. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I have to wonder if I'm so ready to say that. Even as I celebrate Christmas, even as I try to not distance myself so easily from this story and try to place myself in it, And then also ask, all right, how is the love of God confronting me? How am I part of this beautiful clash? This collision that I'm a part of because I'm a human being and God loves me and he's pursuing me. And the same is true for us. Are we so quick to say, behold, I'm a servant of the Lord. May it be done. Let it be to me according to your word. You hear what she's saying there? All right, God, you can do it to me. That's the response to God's comforting and confusing and all-encompassing, imposing love. That's our response. I am a servant of the Lord. And in that, there's great value because the value of the servant is determined by the value of the head of the household, and that's Christ. And he calls us into his love to receive it, but not just to receive it. His love is not something that is to be hoarded and taken in and gone, thanks. It's completely life-changing. It changes the way that we interact with the world around us, with the people in our lives. And it calls us into humble obedience to join him in his plan to restore all things. I want to read this quote here for you. It's a little long, but it's, it's really, really beautiful. 
It's written by a pastor and writer named uh, Frederick, Frederick Buchner. And there's a book called Secrets in the Dark. He says, the face in the sky, the child born in the night among beasts, the sweet breath and steaming dung of beasts, and nothing is ever the same again. Those who believe in God can never in a way be sure of him again. Do you hear that? Those who believe in God can never really be sure of him again. Once they have seen him in a stable, they can never be sure where he will appear or to what lengths he will go or to what ludicrous depths of self-humiliation he will descend in his wild pursuit of humankind. If holiness and the awful power and majesty of God were present in this least auspicious of all events, this birth of a peasant's child, then there is no place or time so lowly and earthbound but that holiness can be present there too. And this means we are never safe. That there is no place where we can hide from God. No place where we are safe from his power to break into and recreate the human heart. Because it is just where he seems most helpless that he is most strong. And just where we least expect him that he comes most fully. Pray with me. Lord, we often don't know how to respond. We want to respond in praise. We want to respond in thanksgiving. Maybe there's even some here this morning who are responding. There's, there's, a, there's something stirring in their heart that troubles them. It's perhaps confusing that this love of God might be impossible. Lord, I pray that you would impress the reality of your love and the truth that a savior has been born to us, a rescuer and king. And that that changes everything. Lord, perhaps some of us take all these things for granted. We confess that to you, that we don't really understand the Christmas story. That we're celebrating on the outside, but really on the inside, we're just trying to get through it all. And we've been unwilling to stop and truly ponder just how imposing your love is. There's nowhere we can hide. That we are not safe from your love. Lord, I pray that you would give us the insight and the courage to respond as Mary did. I'm a servant of the Lord. May it be to me according to your will. Lord, what are you calling us into? What discomforts are you calling us to? Lord, what ways have we chosen to Enjoy an aspect of your love and reject others. I pray that you'd stir in our hearts here this morning. As we consider, even honestly, what would I have said? And that also in that same thought, Lord, I pray that you'd remind us favored in your sight because you love us so much that you sent your son for us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.